I think most of you will know quite a lot about uh, today's speaker, Roy Oram. Uh, I think you'll be aware of his work as a journalist, as a columnist, as a commentator in general. But I thought I might give you just a little bit of background uh, so you, you have some understood where Rob is coming from. So he's a, um, he contributes weekly to Newsroom and Newstalk uh, ZB. He's a public speaker on uh, deep sustainability, business, uh, economies, and economics, and innovation. He's a member of the Edmund Hillary F uh, Fellowship that seeks to contribute to global change from AOT Rock. Um, he's won uh, the general business category winner of the City Court's annual Global uh, Journalism Awards, and he was the New Zealand Journalist of the Year in 2019. He's, um, he, was also, he also won the Business Commentary category in 2018 and 2020 for his newsroom com columns. Um, he's a uh, founding trustee and second chairman of the Akina Foundation, which helps social enterprises develop their business models in areas of sustainability. He's published two books, and he's also uh, contributed a paper on land use, agriculture, and food uh, to a volume called Climate Aotearoa, which was edited by Helen Park. So uh, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Rod, who I've known incidentally, I think, for a number of years. And uh, so I'm sure you're all looking forward to what will be a very insightful talk. Thank you. Um, kia ora tato. It's a huge pleasure to be with you today. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, I know it feels slightly scary to be out and about with lots of other people. Um, but uh, thank you for coming. And, and uh, excuse me, but I have quite to see you lots of I look green. Is it possible for you to talk without your mask? I could. Uh, I, I think the people in the front row don't seem to buy. <laughs> okay, uh, you're right. Um, oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, is that better? Wow, so it's not just a question of volume, it's articulation. Right, very good. Um, so yes, thank you very much for coming. And uh, on especially, it's wonderful to be here on the 25th anniversary of U3A, uh, this chapter. That's a fabulous achievement. Um, I'm a great fan of U3A, and the reason I uh, very uh, gladly accept invitations um, to speak at U3A meetings is because there's always a very engaged audience. But I feel as though I'm banking a contribution towards I'm, when I'm in the audience uh, in just a few years' time. Uh, so uh, I, I hope what goes around comes around. Um, I'm going to speak for uh, about 35 minutes, and I've got my uh, phone telling me how I'm doing, um, so I keep a close eye on that. I will I pre prepare more slides than I'm going to show. Uh, and some slides, are, even then, I might skip over quickly in the interest of time. But I will send to Ralph a PDF of the presentation. And then, therefore, if you want to look back on the slides, uh, or pick up on any of the links, because many of them do have links directly to source material, um, then um, uh, rest assured you can do that. So anyway, here we go. Um, I'm talking about uh, fighting for our future. That's um, humanity um, and the planet. And so this is about how the climate crisis is playing out at home and, and abroad. This clearly is not a definitive uh, a review of all the aspects in play there. Um, but I'll be picking up on just um, a few crucial ones um, as I go through. I'm basically going to be addressing that enormous uh, task in um, three stages. The first one is to talk about the Earth itself. And then the second one is to talk about COP26 in Glasgow last November, uh, the um, annual uh, conference of the parties of um, uh, the UN to uh, the United Nations framework um, on climate. Uh, I was there, um, one of only two journalists from New Zealand to get there in person. Um, and it was a huge privilege to be there. And, um, 
completely uh, fascinating. Um, but then I will um, talk about us and what we're up to here in New Zealand, um, in large part drawing through some big themes for COP, from COP, and how I'm kind of assessing um, how the world is responding um, on climate um, currently. I'm going to start with um, an amazingly challenging quote. This is from Antonio Guterres, um, who is the United Nations Secretary General. Um, I was initially extremely disappointed that uh, he beat Helen Clark to the job, um, but he's turned out to be, I think, a very effective Secretary General. And he's a really deeply fascinating politician because he was a very young um, politician um, in Portugal, um, and very much one of the leaders of um, bringing the country out of the crisis of its revolution uh, and end of military government um, in the early 1970s. Um, so he understands hugely about trying to build community around uh, very difficult political issues. He's also astonishingly articulate. I, I'm not sure these are necessarily entirely his own words. I have heard him speak um, not in person, but I have seen him uh, re seen recordings of him speaking live, um, and so this is he, when he's clearly not scripted. He's still very articulate. So all that is a preamble to this um, astonishingly challenging quote, which which I'll read, even though the words are up there. We are facing a devastating pandemic, new heights of global heating, new lows of ecological degradation and new setbacks in our work towards global goals for more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable development. To put it simply, the state of the planet is broken. Dear friends, humanity is waging war on nature, and this is suicide. I don't think there is a more accurate, uh, or a more succinct, uh, or a more cogent um, summary of what on earth is going on. It is very easy to be overwhelmed by that. I am often, um, but the question is, how do we address that? We could not address it and just let these um, great uh, forces overtake us, or we could respond to them in ways that actually solve all those issues. And to me, what is completely fascinating is how the solutions are interdependent, codependent, but also mutually self-reinforcing. So in terms of how we solve climate, can also do a very great deal um, about solving the degradation of our, the ecosystems, our life support system. And we can do so in ways that are equitable, equitable and socially just, and therefore deal with economic issues at the same time. And so that's why uh, I keep going on this, um, because um, that's um, what we can do. I'm only going to explain these charts and the theme behind them very, very briefly. Um, this is um, from um, the Planetary Boundaries work of the Stockholm Resilience Centre, Johan Rockström and colleagues. Um, this work started in the mid-1990s. Um, uh, and. On the right, sorry, on the left in the orange is a whole bunch of socioeconomic trends, starting with world population upper and then economic activity and running all the way down to international tourism at the bottom. The uh, time frame runs from 1750 uh, to um, 2018, and, and the dotted line most of the way along is 1950. Really important date because that's pretty much when all of these socio-economic trends really took off in a big way. So 1950, thereabouts, is a very pivotal moment in human history. Um, on the right is a whole bunch of Earth system trends. So the top three are greenhouse gases, um, and then we've got things like ozone, surface temperature, fish core, shrimp agriculture, tropical forest loss, and terrestrial biosphere degradation on the right-hand side. And um, so that's the impact on the planet, on ecosystems, on Earth systems, our life support system. During that time from 1950, um, over there is the population. In population, human population in 1950 was only um, two and a half billion. 
Um, I think many of us in this room were born uh, before, in my case, in 1950, or shortly thereafter. And, and in the time that we have been alive, human population has trebled. But our impact um, on the planet has been considerably more than treble um, because of the way we do things uh, and what we um, expect the planet to provide for us. So that's the planetary boundaries, and those are the overshoots of all the key ones. The biggest overshoot is actually not yet climate, but it's um, there at 11 o'clock, uh, the biosphere integrity. So that's uh, the loss of species, the loss of um, biodiversity, um, and the like. Then the next biggest one is down there at sort of 7 o'clock, and that's biogeochemical flows, and that's artificial form of phosphate and nitrogen used in food production worldwide. Uh, we know what that means in our rivers with nitrate and phosphorus. And those are by far the biggest overshoots. Uh, and climate, we've set on a track which is rapidly um, shooting out, uh, uh, out of that overshoot. And, and, the, and um, that's um, the basic picture out there. Um, there is um, a fantastic book by Johan Rockström called Breaking Boundaries, which is written uh, in the last couple of years with David Attenborough. And the two of them um, did this terrific Netflix documentary um, that was released last year. And um, I think it's still live there on Netflix. Uh, very well worth watching. Um, they tend to rush the end, which is sort of the solutions. Um, and I think it's right, though, to dwell on the causes. Um, but I can highly recommend that. I won't delve into the detail here, but this is basically the difference between a one and a half degree rise in temperature and a two degree rise, and therefore how much worse two degrees is versus one and a half on loss of species, loss of insects, further declining coral, extreme heat, um, sea ice, free summers in the Arctic, and the rest. So we think we're only juggling around half a degree, but there is a fundamental difference between keeping the rise in temperature to uh, one and a half degrees uh, rather than two. Which takes me to COP26 um, in Glasgow um, um, uh, in the first um, two weeks of November. They did indeed run, as all COPs do, uh, over time by a day um, before they got to their final statement. Um, a very historic place for COP because Glasgow is indeed one of the centers of the Industrial Revolution uh, as it unfolded in Britain. That crane there was an amazing crane and um, that used to lift locomotives made in Glasgow, uh, steam engines for the railways, uh, which had been hauled across town uh, initially by horses, then by steam traction engines, and then later by um, road tractors. Um, from uh, several uh, locomotive works to the docks. And that crane could lift 600 ton locomotives. Um, and, sorry, um, sorry, they weren't that heavy. Uh, about uh, 60 to 70 ton locomotives. And uh, over the course of its lifetime, it shipped hundreds of them around the world. These days, it's not the port, that's all uh, downstream towards Greenwich. Um, but this is the Scottish Events Campus. The building on the left is the, um, called the Armadillo. The building on the right is called, of the crane is called the Hydro. And, uh, and, and in between uh, was a largely temporary structure um, built around a, a very large exhibition hall to house COP for two weeks and the 40,000, uh, to which 40,000 people came uh, were delegates um, over that time which meant there was always a bit of a queue getting in in the morning. Uh, very strict COVID passes and security to get in each day. And I will just very briefly show you a little bit of video. Um, this is the main thoroughfare through COP. And as you can see, it's just a temporary structure. And literally off to one side of this picture is a, is a kind of, this is the north-south route, there was an east-west route across. This is the intersection. Main plenary halls, one side, meeting rooms on the other, media center this way, um, and sort of exhibition center where um, business and all sorts of civil society um, held, um, had stands, held programs, and then the hydro and armadillo were this way. Uh, I won't show you the whole thing, but this will just give you um, a, a bit of an idea.
Um, now, this is the main plenary room, um, which can seat uh, delegates from uh, almost every country in the world. A couple of countries didn't manage to send any. Um, and uh, delegates from supporting organizations um, right there on the left-hand side is the World Bank, for example, then some uh, staff behind that and some observers and then the press. Um, this was a hall that um, could seat um, at desks um, about um, 600 people. And then this is what a negotiating group looked like uh, with only one person in there. Uh, you had to arrive in Glasgow um, to be a delegate. There was no online um, access. However, if you uh, tested positive for COVID while you were there and were confined to your hotel room, then you could join the sessions um, online. And um, these were smaller meeting rooms with less space uh, than usual, uh, which became a source of friction, particularly from the civil society delegates, um, because by the time government delegates had been seated and then um, staff and the rest, there was very little space left for civil society delegates. And that erupted uh, by the last day in some uh, demonstrations inside the building, which I will uh, get to. Um, this is the press room. This is only one half of it. Uh, there were facilities for 3,000 press, but unless you staked out your desk, um, by um, about 9.30 in the morning, you were then lucky to find a place later. So I always used to arrive early. And I used to love that uh, far corner um, up there, um, which uh, looks like that. Um, I used to tuck myself away back in that corner. Um, this is in the hydro. This is, was called the Action Hub, and it was a wonderful place for gathering. Uh, that, I will just show you a tiny bit of uh, video on, on this side um, here. Um, that's um, the um, hub um, uh, with people coming and going. Wonderful informal meeting places, um, lots of TV um, studios and the rest. Out, you could sit up in the stands for a quiet place, um, and then there was wonderful um, seats it, running all the way around the outside of the building in a gallery looking out over um, Glasgow. It was um, it was far less formal than elsewhere, um, but it was a, a completely um, fabulous place to um, meet. I don't know, I'm still trying to get the data from the UN, um, but I would guess that the median age of delegates was um, late 30s at most. Um, I was very impressed how many very um, bright, experienced, energetic, equipped people there were there. I found that almost everybody I talked to, regardless of age, had three uh, essential attributes about them. The first one was, they were incredibly knowledgeable, they, and they had this clearly steely-eyed view of what was going on and what needed to be done. Secondly, despite all the slow progress, lack of uh, setback, lack of progress, setbacks, and everything else, they were also um, relentlessly driving on with the future. The third thing was they were always seeking new knowledge. Um, they were very keen to hear what was going on. Uh, they were very keen to talk to you to find out what you could tell them. And um, um, very willing, many of them, to work with strange bedfellows, if you like, um, unlikely partners. These are three new, young New Zealand delegates. Um, M.G. Johnston on the left-hand side, uh, Ali Cole and um, Nina Jeffs. Um, on the right hand side, all extremely capable young women, um, very well educated, wonderful experience. Um, Nina, for example, has a master's um, from Beijing University, and she's a researcher at Chatham House uh, in, the, in London. And um, indeed, there were, this is so typical, this picture I took, of people huddled around computers, you know, working out stuff. Um, it was uh, really extraordinary. The business side of this was very big. Business really stepped up. Um, this is a, um, uh, a panel discussion on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, the person on the right-hand side is the chief executive of United Airlines. Next to him, uh, going left, is the chief executive of Rolls-Royce Aero Engines. 
um, by um, 2025, all of its existing aero engines will be certified to run on sustainable fuel as it becomes more available. Person on the next is a venture capitalist in synthetic fuels. And then that's Jennifer Hungren on the left, chief executive of Lanza Tech and Lanza Jet, um, founded here in Auckland um, and uh, proved its technology down the Glenbrook Steel Mill for capturing carbon monoxide from steel mill chimneys and um, running that through water, feeding it on by a bacteria that turn it uh, into the basic building blocks of petrochemicals uh, with, uh, and um, in synthetic fuel. And um, Jennifer is an extremely extraordinary, um, an extraordinary woman scientist from Costa Rica uh, who's had her whole career in the States and is now chief executive of uh, Lanza Tech in Chicago. This is um, Osnan uh, from Turkey. I, I, I'm exchanging gifts with him because I, I took some little lapel badges for from New Zealand and um, silver ferns and, uh, and, the, and the rest that I handed out to people that I particularly enjoyed. Uh, and he, they were saying at the Turkish Pavilion and I couldn't resist the picture of myself in front of the globe. Uh, there were quiet places. This is a corner of the armadillo. Um, which where you could find some respite from um, the great throngs. Outside there was very little in the way of protest. This is by the main security gate um, and um, the substantial police force were very relaxed um, but still there were some powerful um, um, demonstrations there, uh, small scale. This is the corpses from pollution, drought, famine, um, suicide, um, skin cancer and war. And then um, down in the center of Glasgow, um, this is George Square, and this was a, a wonderful um, band that uh, was um, um, playing um, just before um, the youth uh, demonstrations there, the first Saturday. So a uh, wonderful Scottish take. Uh, the following Saturday uh, was uh, a global day of protest uh, for climate, and this is um, uh, the very large march making its way down to um, George Square um, in the centre of Glasgow. As I said, there was a great deal of frustration amongst um, civil society delegates, so you, you've got official government delegates, politicians and civil servants, uh, you've got the likes of um, 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 business and NGOs uh, as the other main group of delegates. Um, but within that civil sort of society, there's, uh, from NGOs and others, uh, there was a great deal of dissatisfaction um, that spilled over um, on um, the last uh, full day. Um, and this is them marching out of um, 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 the main um, conference area, um, all holding on to this red rope of solidarity, um, and um, it was um, an amazing number of people, this was an extraordinarily coordinated, uh, walked out of the, of the negotiations. So, um, there were a number of successes about COP, co uh, but I will rapidly get on to what failed. Um, there is, I, I think, a very strongly uh, developed sense that one and a half degrees is the target we're heading for. And there was, uh, at least amongst all the country delegates, all the, there was no country that resiled from that, but of course not any agreement on the speed of travel. So quite a few nations in, uh, increased their own uh, commitment to climate, uh, but in crucially these now uh, need to be reset every year, not every five years. And they must also set five-year budgets to show how they're tracking, not 10-year budgets, and demonstrate their policies and outcomes. So that's quite a big um, tightening up of the requirements which were established at Paris in 2015. Um, the next big thing was um, about uh, 120 countries pledged to a 30% reduction in methane by 2030. It really was fascinating last year how quickly methane shot to the top 
of uh, climate agenda. Um, because um, methane is a very potent gas, um, climate-wise, um, and uh, there's a lot that can be done quite quickly, particularly in the oil and gas industry, particularly methane leaking from pipelines and production facilities, um, that can take some of the pressure um, off um, the rise in temperature whilst we work on the harder job of um, dealing with CO2 emissions. And hence, that's what the pledge is about. But agriculture is, in fact, a larger source of methane than the oil and gas sector. It's that agriculture is the largest source globally. Um, and it's very much in that pledge. Now, very interestingly, New Zealand signed up to that pledge, even though our commitments on methane are grossly inadequate. Uh, and we have no policies or much determination from our agricultural sector to reduce methane. I'll come back to that later. Um, very, very big movement on finance. Uh, the Global Finan the Glasgow Financial Alliance on Net Zero G Fans. This was institutional investors responsible for $130 trillion worth of assets, US dollars, saying, yes, we are committed to mobilizing as much of that money as we can as an investment opportunities arise on climate. Very importantly, the Paris Agreement rulebook was finally agreed. Um, six years late, or six years after Paris, on carbon markets and transparency. Uh, transparency but is about how countries uh, report their progress. And um, interestingly, James Shaw, our climate minister, um, had led the carbon markets working party in the pre two previous COPs. And in this COP, um, he led the transparency one. Um, he, all of the, that leadership is co-led with somebody from developing, somebody from a, a developing country. In this case, it was for the Minister of the Environment for, for Barbuda and Antigua um, in the Caribbean. And very, very interestingly, uh, it was um, a, 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 a global working party of civil servants who put that rule book together over the last six years led from New Zealand by a, 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 a person with much experience in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade called Helen Plume, um, who is one of the world's experts on how countries should report. And Helen and her team um, really were very influential in developing that work about how countries report in a transparent way. And James was very, um, very involved in getting that over the line and getting it passed. So New Zealand did play um, a useful role there. And there was some, um, some progress on ending coal in electricity uh, generation and a whole bunch of other alliances. But this is the, I won't dwell on the detail here, um, but what countries have committed to so far, and, and this is even allowing the fact they don't have policies to deliver on what they're committing to, still leaves us very, very far short of the reduction in emissions that has to happen uh, very rapidly. Um, and uh, there were also, uh, and again, I won't dwell on the detail here, but the central fact is that if we're serious about one and a half degrees, we have to cease emissions in nine years. That, of course, that's impossible. And um, so uh, we are, um, uh, so that's why net becomes important about trying to sequester carbon and the rest. And that's how incredibly tight um, the, the, um, the time frame is now. So we're almost out of time. Um, if you just look at the major companies in the world, stock market listed, um, on their current emissions, their share of what's left in that one and a half degree budget, they would exhaust in five years. Clearly, they're not going to get there, and, and this is the main concern that I have, is that people, I just don't think enough people have got their head around the scale of that. Along with this, all this goes the very substantial impact on biodiversity and, and ecosystems, and just four value chains, being food, um, and infrastructure and transport, energy and fashion, account for most of that. Uh, of which food is half. So we've got these co-crises of climate and biodiversity.
and, and the solutions of the two are interdependent. So, and we've got the United Nations uh, protocol on climate, and we've also got the framework on biodiversity. And this last year was the first year that um, the delegates of both were trying to bring them together, uh, and the UN trying to drive that. And I'm going to speed up a bit and just say that um, trying to find solutions uh, that are nature-based, i.e., uh, first of all, taking our, 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 our foot off the neck of nature, um, but then relying on, on nature to help us solve many of these issues, um, is a really important concept here. And that can help us meet about a third of those big reductions. Lots of interesting things going on around economics uh, of biodiversity. Um, so um, the Das Gupta report last year on biodiversity and economics is um, equivalent to the Stern report in 2006 um, on the economics of um, the climate crisis. Um, so there's real progress there. But how we use land to uh, farm and grow food um, is the fundamental issue. So um, EAT is a very excellent um, Scandinavian NGO on this. And uh, of course, the Lancet is the um, extraordinary UK um, medical journal. And so they talk about their, their reports are about food in the Anthropocene, one of the greatest health and environmental challenges of the 21st century. And because the food we eat actually is doing us not much good. So we literally have, many of us not much good, so we literally have more obese people in the world because of the nature of the food they eat and overeating and the rest, and we have undernourished people in the world. And there's all sorts of illness attached to various of the foods we eat. And yes, um, the industrial food system has been brilliant at delivering lots of calories, very cheaply, but they're empty calories. They're all energy and no nutrition. Um, and the way we do this um, is very damaging to the planet. So this is methane as a percentage of um, a country's, uh, me the farm footprint of methane as a percentage of a country's methane output. And you can see that's us on the far left there um, at um, uh, you know, far more substantial any other country in the world. Uh, this chart was just from The Economist last week about how total land use um, and um, uh, um, uh, agriculture accounts for 50% of human land use and forests the other 37%. But of that agricultural use, 35% is pasture um, to grow feed for animals. So if uh, we um, don't have to go all the way to uh, um, non-meat diets, but um, the great progression on that journey uh, starts to turn that around. Many of the major food companies are very focused on this. So Nestle is the world's largest food producer. It's planning to reduce its emissions by 50% um, by 2030, and it's uh, very determined. It's a, it's a company that delivers on what it um, set, the goals it sets itself, and to be net zero by 2050. So in terms of Aotearoa, uh, our greatest opportunity um, is to draw on these nature-based solutions, because of all the countries in the world, we have the largest stock of natural capital per person in the world. Um, and um, um, so we have, um, uh, uh, we, we have tremendous opportunities here. Now, I won't dwell on what we agreed to at um, COP. We did indeed um, increase our national determined contribution. Uh, it's getting reasonably, uh, it, it's getting towards where we need to be, except on methane. Um, but we absolutely are devoid of the policies to get there. So even under the um, re, um, proposals that the Climate Change Commission made to the government last year, and the government is now working on um, to come up with its emissions reduction plan by May 31st this year, um, we will only achieve about 25% 
of the emissions we are committed to um, by um, 2030 and, and then 2040. And the rest will be through offsets, uh, either forestry at home, uh, which has all sorts of problems attached to it, uh, or by, by buying carbon credits overseas. That's how adrift we are uh, on plans to actually um, deliver on what we promise. And uh, we signed up to um, 27 packs overall. Um, it, I won't dwell on that. Um, we were very busy at COP. So um, half our emissions are from agriculture, the other half from transport, electricity, and waste. And um, there's two completely different pictures there. On the left-hand side, it requires um, a lot of science and technology and a great deal of investment um, to be able to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we can see the pathways globally for doing that. The International Energy Agency has a very um, rigorous roadmap to net zero energy by 2050 for the world. That's doable, um, but it's very expensive. It requires a large capital investment to completely change the way we um, get ourselves around and our vehicles, etc. On the right-hand side is all the emissions from agriculture, but the science involved in reducing those and changes in farming practice, we know what many of them are, and we have farmers practicing them in New Zealand. Um, Sinlay is the best large example of that amongst um, a, a milk company um, that is on track for delivering those emissions. Um, and the actual cost of doing that is not great in changes in farming systems. So there's a, a real juxtaposition between the two. Yet, um, there is no momentum on the agricultural side at all. Fonterra still refuses to set any targets for reducing car uh, methane. Uh, it focuses, uh, the only targets it's set are on the 9% of its emissions from CO2 from the energy it uses to transport milk and process it, and then the products um, to get out around the world. And the uh, Haywalker Ekonoa, which is the government um, primary sector working party to devise solutions um, for how to um, price, well, measure, manage, price, and mitigate farm emissions um, has already had two extension deadlines and it's now going to be reporting only after the government has completed its emissions reduction plan. And so um, there are uh, very serious issues here. Uh, um, there's more here from the Climate Commission, but I won't dwell on them. There's Fonterra down at the bottom um, uh, with um, 42 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions a year. Uh, it's um, the only larger dairy company is Dairy Farmers of America of 52 million. You know, Nestle is half Fonterra, for example. And um, so um, Fonterra is responsible for about 20% of our emissions. Um, and if in total, and therefore, if it and our fa its farmers don't move, it is completely impossible for us to meet the commitments we've made internationally. It's as simple as that. I spend a lot of time in the primary sector, and I'm fundamentally um, stuck, puzzled, very worried about how the mindset has developed amongst the most senior leaders um, in um, it, this is not blanket, there are some people doing some good stuff out there. Um, but basically, they're saying, we're already the lowest emissions in the world per kilogram of milk solid, per kilogram of meat, therefore it's up to the, re the rest of the world to catch up with us. There's not much we have to do. They're completely failing to understand that all the debate, all the investment, all the work overseas is taking farming off in, and food off in a different direction. And I, I, I'm stunned that they can't see that this is the best business opportunity they're ever going to have. And, and I just can't, I and others just can't break through that. I, I, and at the highest level of Fonterra, I, I find it deeply, deeply frustrating and um, quite frankly, rather frightening. That's two examples of how Fonterra is not performing on a sustainability scorecard. So we're struggling. This is true of humankind. I'm not being particularly hard on 
New Zealand here. But across society, there is still a lack of focus and an inefficient sense of urgency uh, about all this. So, yes, that's global, but it's certainly true in New Zealand. Again, globally, but certainly true in New Zealand, we're seeing vested interests are defending their current business and pollution models, and businesses in general as being too timid and incremental. Yes, there are industry leaders in business. I saw that at COP. Um, but um, I find it very hard to identify any amongst our major emitters here. Our politicians just plain don't focus on the issue, so, and they can't agree on the facts of the urgency. So um, we get quite remarkable statements, uh, even out of Labour. Um, the Greens are more steely eyed on this than, and no more and are more sensible on this than anybody else. But even that's even true of Labour, it's more true of National, and uh, an act is completely off the chart um, on this. Our civil servants aren't developing cooperative and interdisciplinary ways of working. Um, and uh, that's a big change that has to happen. And um, it's still very much they are the policy holders, they will, they will consult, they will get some advice. Um, to a moot point how much they actually absorb and apply of that, um, but that's not how these solutions work. What we're seeing where they do work is being able to get terrific alliances together to solve issues. The most fascinating one is what's going on with um, sustainable aviation fuel, um, and um, in the UK they're talking about building 14 sustainable aviation fuel plants at a billion US dollars a pop. And, and we can't even get our act together um, to save Marsden Point refinery, which could have been repurposed to do that using wood waste from the forest harvest in Northland. Even though Lancetec um, and Z Energy, uh, I think Z Energy was a weak player in that, um, and Air New Zealand um, you know, did have a working group, but just couldn't break through the government at all. So we're falling behind international leaders in our core sectors, um, particularly such as farming. And we're, we're still failing to understand the consequences of not acting. You know, I can't be more clear about that, uh, about um, the breakdown in our life support system, which are Earth systems. But then the most extraordinary thing of all is the benefits of acting um, are so fabulous. I'm not promising nirvana from all this, um, but um, as Guterres and others um, are very articulate about, we can actually address these issues um, in the time left, um, and uh, or largely address, address them in the time left, and, and derive huge benefits from that. And I just plain find it incredibly frustrating um, that um, about not being able to get that message across. So we're trying to achieve these three huge transformations from an extractive economy to one that helps regenerate ecosystems. Um, from profit um, to planet, now you still need to make a profit, but it can't be entirely financially driven. You've got to have um, those other um, goals in play as well. And we've got to get our act together um, from them to us. As you see from this chart, uh, there's very little atmosphere in the world. If you brought all the atmosphere in the world together at sea level pressure, it would be the size of that um, small um, blob on the uh, right hand side. And all the fresh water in the world would be that, is that blue block, that's the surface fresh water. And all, uh, all the surface water, so oceans are spread remarkably thin, but all the surface fresh water on the planet, if you brought it together one place, it would be less than the distance from here to Auckland. And I'd cover that distance in an hour, getting here today. Young people, oh, sorry, I've gone on far too long, but I want to make a, in closing, because I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to offer you some sense of hope here. Uh, is that um, young people do actually think about this fundamentally differently than even older people like me who are onto these issues. This is really, really interesting work. 
last year by the World Economic Forum because they have um, members, um, but they also have um, a group of, um, the, um, they call them uh, the Global um, Shaper Community, is a network of young people. And when they ask them about what's the uh, impact of technology, uh, the negative impact of technology, what's the likelihood of that, that's uh, the horizontal access, what's the impact of that? Um, the lower, small um, um, uh, diamond shapes there are the older members of the World Economic Forum. Um, and um, the bigger dots um, are um, the younger members. Um, typically under about 40. But these are not, um, these are really well-educated people in really powerful jobs or, or roles. These, these are not, you know, these are not um, people who have sort of given up and, and trying to bury their head in the sand. So on um, digital inequality, digital um, power concentration, cyber security failure, IT infrastructure breakdown, and the likelihood of big impact issues um, it is far stronger in their minds. That's true also about economic issues, but it's completely uh, e extraordinarily um, ex um, evident in environmental issues. And that's why, given the young demographic of so many of the delegates at COP26, um, you know, this for me is the real hope. And, and I know that my role in life is only to help people like this the best I can. That, that's the focus of my work. Um, and, uh, and then also sort of trying to get the messages out there more generally. Um, but that's quite extraordinary that they understand the negative impact of all that's going on. Um, and the likelihood of that happening, whether it's biodiversity loss, extreme weather, climate action failure, natural resource crisis, geophysical disasters. And, and that's why um, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm hugely, hugely committed to those young people. And then again, you can see the same on societal. It's extraordinary where they're at in terms of their perspicacity as to what's going on. So these issues are increasingly global, um, and yet the solutions are increasingly local. Actually, action happens on the ground. So what happens in, in a life, in a household, in a small place like Walkworth, in a small city like Auckland, in a small country like New Zealand, and that's where action changes, because we've got to achieve this unprecedented speed of change and scale of change and complexity of change that humankind has never come within cooey of before. But it can be done. And so we need very strong learning communities that have a common sense, a common understanding of what needs to be done, a common purpose about how it's going to be done, and understand the common wealth that can be generated from that. Some of it will be economic, but the, by far the greater is going to be, you know, um, a livable planet um, and, and social um, and cultural and uh, environmental um, um, wealth of, of a kind, uh, of, of a positive kind. So these are communities where individuals are valued and helped and encouraged, and in turn they all, they all participate and change. Now, of course, each of us can only do our infinitesimally small thing. But if an almost infinite number of us do our infinitesimally small thing, that matters, that makes the difference. And that's why an individual response, a personal responsibility, um, is so fundamentally important, uh, beginning in our own backyards. Almost done, wonderful books to read, The Future We Choose by Christina Cristiano Figueres, uh, who was chair of the UN process um, that landed the Paris Agreement, still wonderfully articulate, Jonathan Porritt, son of our Governor General, um, back in the, six, in the 70s, I guess, Arthur Porritt was Governor General. And wonderful voices from the past. This is Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring. 
the human race is challenged more than ever before to demonstrate our mastery not over nature, but of ourselves. And um, this was a cartoon, I'll read the small print at the bottom, uh, this was in the New Yorker last week, as you can see it's somebody who staggered out of some kind of time machine, um, and he said, I went back to warn them, but they already knew and didn't seem to care. <laughs> Thanks very much. stopwatch telling me I've spoken for 48 minutes. Um, so I was, I was, I was, I had momentum. <laughs> um, you're, okay, you answer this. Oh yes, no, please, please. I, I've spoken far too much. Yes, correct. Right. Um, you mentioned the carbon Sorry, the question was, um, UN is trying to uh, bring about a global market in carbon, and um, it's extremely difficult to do. The obvious analogy is, you can trade US dollars around the world, you, um, but then it gets harder and uh, more difficult to trade shares around the world, um, but you can devise systems where there is interoperability between stock exchanges, and, um, and you can get some international trading um, in those other financial instruments. So realistically, um, there is never going to be uh, a, a unified global market, but there has to be the most rigorous standards possible of transparency and rigor um, in any carbon credit. So that when it was still, so that when you buy a credit or you can put some money into that, um, you have a reasonable degree of certainty that that credit is going to do the job that it's supposed to do. And so that's where the emphasis is developing. Um, and, um, but it'll still be a very, very long time before we have more interoperability uh, between national carbon markets. Um, the EU is the best example because geographically that's and in terms of volume, it's by far the biggest one. Um, China, for example, has now got a number of, um, though localized, um, covering large areas and potentially in due course will be big carbon markets. So, as I say, it's just sort of trying to get that transparency through is, is the biggest task. Very good, thank you. Oh, yes, what is Sinlake doing that Fonterra isn't? Um, it, it's doing an important thing first, which everybody has to do. Uh, you have to set a goal uh, that you know that's what the science is telling you in terms of how much you need to reduce your emissions over how long a period of time. And so you set yourself a goal that you might well not know how to achieve. But it's only when you set that goal that you start to focus your mind and your money and your science and everything else on that. Now, in Sinley's case, um, that's not as extreme as it sounds, um, because there is uh, all sorts of um, farming practices in terms of um, pasture management and, and uh, forage and, and, and the like um, that you can um, bring together um, to um, reduce emissions. And this has been, um, a lot of that knowledge has been known for um, quite a while. Um, and uh, we've had individual farmers um, and small groups of farms. So there's kind of groups like um, Atta Regenerative and Khan Farm uh, and Quorum Sense are, are all good examples of that. But Sinde is the first large um, dairy processor um, to bring that together in a, in a formal way 
um, uh, 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 for its, its suppliers. And so there's no great science, I'm sorry, there is great science underlying that, but that's progress that's achievable without some sort of great scientific breakthrough. And I am puzzled by um, the likes of Fonterra and Dairy New Zealand saying that there's not much we can do, which probably isn't true because people are doing it, um, but we're very much depending on science to um, break give us a breakthrough on methane from um, a, a, a vaccine or an inhibitor of some kind. I'm going, well, hang on a second. We're trying to sell a very natural product. So we're trying to say we're going to sell milk. That we're saying, oh, don't worry, there's very low methane here. Oh, by the way, we used a vaccine to make sure the cows didn't produce. Um, and a vaccine is a really intrusive way of dealing with the very complicated rumen and, and biological life that's going on inside the three stomachs of the cow. Um, but, and um, so the far more natural ways of doing this are far more desirable. And um, some really interesting things coming through. Um, one of them being um, uh, Aragopsis, which is a, a red seaweed that um, handily grows very well in New Zealand and some Australian waters, the cooler Australian waters. And has very, very good potential. And it's very hard to harvest it. It's easy to grow. It's hard to harvest it and keep it fresh so that the um, active ingredients that you need to get from the seaweed into the stomach of the cow, um, that's the hard part of this. But Stephen Tindall, who is our bravest and most insightful venture capitalist, um, is. Um, has invested strongly in a company called CH4, um, and the science from that comes out of CSIRO in Australia. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the science has been known. Um, we're now in the process, they're now in the process of trying to work out how to um, um, cultivate the seaweed, but also, crucially, um, making sure that the, the beneficial aspects of its nutrition work through into the cows. And I'm actually, uh, there's big issues to solve there, but I'm actually quite optimistic about that. So, really, so that's the general landscape, and it's, but the, the reason that Simlay is making progress is that it set itself some goals, um, and it's incentivizing its farmers to meet them. Um, and in a sense, the story is as simple as that, um, and, it's, and what's really going on there is about getting more of the existing knowledge out to farmers and into their practices, rather than hoping, pinning the hope on some no great scientific breakthrough. And I've always suspected, I, and I've never been able to, I can't prove it, I've no evidence of this at all, that um, all this emphasis on some holy grail of science is a great excuse for not doing anything in the meantime. Um, it's, uh, I feel essentially it's what's going on. No, um, I mean, yes, there were energetic presentations on it. Sorry, the, the question was about carbon capture and storage. Um, this is, the, the technology is still very, very, very difficult. And um, there is um, a wonderful Swiss stroke Iceland company whose name I can never keep firm in my mind. Uh, which is making good progress. Uh, and there is an awful lot of science and capital going into it. Um, but, and in due course, we are going to need to be able to um, pull off um, carbon capture and storage uh, at some scale to be able to get um, CO2 levels um, back down to reasonable levels. But, we can't hang around waiting for that to happen. We've actually got to reduce emissions in the meantime. And, and so the focus, the, the overriding focus of COP is actual emissions reductions now, um, and preferably with real reductions, not offsets, and, and preferably with nature-based solutions other than offsets 
to help all that happen. And behavior change, and technology change of various kinds. And yes, keep putting money into carbon capture and storage, um, but um, it's still astonishingly expensive um, and very small scale and far, far less efficient than is going to be needed to make that work. Uh, I must admit, of all the things I try to keep an eye on, I only keep half an eye on carbon capture and storage um, because um, it's just not going to deliver fast enough. I'm, key, I'm, I'm interested in what's going on there, but I, I only keep a, a sort of a vague watch and brief on it. It's also incredibly expensive. The sequestration of carbon dioxide is very expensive, a small scale, and, and uh, much cheaper to actually stop the emissions. Yes, I, I had a slightly testy moment with my financial advisor last week when we were having an annual review, and he said, "Oh yes, we're we're really focused on uh, investing in you know on, on ESG and brand and society and government measures and of sustainability and investing in the right companies. So um, we're really keyed on Santos, and I said Santos, but Santos is an Australian natural gas company. Yes, yes, but they're capturing." carbon dioxide to inject back into the wells. And I said, yes, but they're doing that to produce more of the stuff. <laughs> so the amount of carbon they have captured to put back in the well is going to produce more gas that's going to produce far more CO2 than they've stuffed back in the well. So I said, could you just go back and revisit that one? I think that fails on various levels. <laughs> Peter Kammler and I are giving a talk. Yeah. Peter Kammler and I are giving a talk um, at Ranfurly Hall next Wednesday afternoon. Peter on the history and me on the uh, potential future, when I'll be addressing carbon capture and storage in more detail. So anybody is welcome to come along at Ranfurly Hall at two o'clock. Two o'clock. A week on Thursday, the twenty fourth. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I don't see. Question. I've been seeing for. A long time, and I know you're really keen on it, and I, I it's a key, key working at it, but as to say, right. So, so, it's not about the emphasis on goals, yes, across the world. It's on a purely practical and hopefully immediate basis, subjectively, from your point of view, what could everyone in this room choose as their most important goals in the immediate future? It's a fabulous question, thank you. And, um, it's very easy, actually, to um, get a reasonably accurate um, picture of your own, um, say, your own greenhouse gas emissions, the emissions from your lifestyle. Um, and um, so, for example, um, Toitu Envirocare, which used to be um, uh, Envirocare, name change now, uh, is part of Land Care Research. Toitu, T-O-I-T-U, um, has a very good um, carbon calculator um, for households. And, and it's only approximate, but it gives you an idea of, of where um, your main sources of um, emissions are. And um, then there are just um, so many sources out there of um, very useful information to um, help you make decisions to, to reduce that. And um, of course, it, it, I mean, it's not all about the car you drive um, or um, the food you eat, but you can just sort of chip away at these. You, you can make some small changes that um, um, do, do make a difference and, and just begin to think about that kind of thing. Um, that's, that's the main thing. That's the, that's the first thing. The second thing is to start thinking more about um, the living planet. Um, so um, about how we can give back to nature what we take from nature. So um, the likes of composting rather than uh, or, and, and reusing and repurposing things rather than sending off, them off to the tip. It's just, it's just start exploring these basic themes 
that underlie all this. And my wife and I are very conscious of this because we're in the process of selling our house that we've had for 25 years, our first open homes for last uh, weekend, and um, this past weekend. And um, it was quite distressing about how much stuff we accumulated at that time, over that time. And um, but we had, our house was built in the 1940s, actually during the war, um, but we had made it into a net zero energy house. So the house generates more electricity than we use for the house and for one electric car. So it's a net zero energy house. And um, with the energy efficiency um, consultant who helped us do that work, Joe's done a lovely job on producing a flyer which we're giving out to people coming around. I mean, we, we, we heat the house for less than $3 a day in winter. Um, and, and this is an old house. You know, um, and it's been a, a real pleasure to do that. So we eliminate and we use um, uh, Ecotricity as an electricity company because they do the carbon offsetting for the electricity we use. Because we think we're renewable energy, but of course we, some isn't. Uh, but even geothermal produces um, a lot of, a, a fair chunk of greenhouse gas emissions um, from um, uh, the, 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 the that's caught up in the water, hot water coming out from the geothermal source, and um, so we've over sort of the last ten years or so, uh, we're pretty much down now to food as a as a source of greenhouse gas emissions, and it's no great drama uh, about um, we are for some years have been reduction areas. We just naturally reduce how much meat we, we use. We haven't eat, we haven't given up on meat altogether. And and um, it's hard to give up on cheese. But it, you can kind of get I can get to oat milk reasonably well. Um, so it, it, it's just about being on the journey, quite honestly. And and have a sense of fun and excitement about um, knowing that uh, it's really interesting to find out about this stuff. Uh, and um, you get all kinds of benefits. Um, you know, I, I drive a, a, a 2004 Prius, which eventually we're going to get um, emission standards on cars in 2025. This car has been meeting that emission standard since it was made in 2004. Um, and it's still going strong with almost 200,000 kilometers on it. And then it's still wonderfully quiet to drive as one of the original hybrids. So th th there's all this pleasure to be had. It's not all about a sense of virtue. There's genuine pleasure and interest to be found um, in being on the journey and encouraging others in a gentle way to be so. Yes, yes very sensible yeah. and sensitive information about what's going on in the country as a whole. Um, we have a daughter who works for them, so I've got a vested best interest there, but they are a really good organisation to follow uh, and to read and to take on board some of the stuff that come out. Yes, I, I'm, the, I'm a huge fan of Eka, and if you just search online for Gen Less, um, that has in, um, it, I, I think it's a little pun about becoming the generation that has less carbon. But there's something about less electricity generation there, I'm sure. Um, but um, Eco's advice is really, really good. And um, if, for example, you're thinking about changing a car, um, they have a, a wonderful online tool um, for looking at the um, whole uh, total cost of ownership of various car models. Um, and um, a, a, all the data is on when the cars were new. So if you were buying a second-hand car, you could still find the data there from when it was new. Um, but that is a wonderful tool for um, helping you decide um, what, uh, and this is about spending large sums of money on electric cars, um, you know, what, what might be a better car for you. Uh, can I ask yeah. a question, or make an observation about Fonterra? 
And uh, most corporations are very concerned, very sensitive about their future markets. But one could imagine uh, a future generation of Kiwis and other countries deciding that Von Terra's products are actually damaging the climate. And so they prefer to buy other people's dairy products. Um, <laughs> um, Von Terra's largest single customer is Nestle. I know that Nestle is talking to Fonterra. I haven't quite worked out what they're saying. And I did, at COP, run into two very senior Nestle people who gave me a bit of an insight on that. And Fonterra, though, response is, oh, it's great, Nestle is buying more milk from us now than they used to because we're lower emissions milk. <laughs> I said, Fine, that's about as short a term of view as you could possibly have, because they're only buying the milk from you now because you are low emissions, but if other people going off in a different direction are also going to be lower emissions than you are going to be, you're going to lose that. And, and you're going to lose it even before that happens if you refuse to set any targets and invest in achieving them. Um, because um, a company like Nestle is going to want to work with companies that are on the journey um, and, and um, so don't be fooled by a little uptick in Nestle purchases recently. I think probably uh, we should uh, stop there. Uh, I think we've punished Rob sufficiently <laughs> for going over time on his talk by actually extending question time quite a bit. Uh, anyway, I'll ask him to vote the middle vote. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, um, Rod, I've always been fascinated by your um, your uh, comments on mainly on national radio, and uh, I've, you, you've been betting on about Frontier for years, and they keep, keep kicking the can down the road, unfortunately. But um, I was. One of the one of the last commentaries I heard was you, you and Kennedy Moore did a bike ride from Taranaki over to the East Cape, and that was amazing. You know, to, to, to just get the picture of where you were and what you did was the Olympic point. No, no. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was going to grab it for that. <laughs> I, I do have an electric bike, but I use it pretty much only to go into the centre of town dressed like this for meetings, so I don't turn up on the sweater. Uh, but no, we pedalled across uh, the Great Kapiko route, a thousand kilometres last March. Man, that was hard work. Uh, but you really wonder, because it's mostly off roads, uh, uh, or rural back roads. And Kennedy's a wonderful person to ride with, because he's a fantastic food forager. And I can tell if I'm riding behind him, he's scanning the hedgerows left and right. But all of a sudden, he will screech to a halt and plunge into a hedgerow and come out with food to eat. That's completely wonderful. Very good comment. Yeah. No, it was a great commentary too. Um, uh, just, just uh, an aside, uh, we just invested in a home in Kona, fully electric, and we're about to invest in some um, uh, solar panels for our house. Uh, you know, we're off the grid too very shortly. Um, and I think the challenge you put out to us, um, for, for all of us, whether you know, we can afford the, some of these things, we can make differences in those small steps. So uh, I'd just like you to um, put your hands together for such a wonderful um, presentation we've had this morning. Thank you.